hi. Um, thanks for coming. Before I start, I really want to thank you for coming. I watch a lot of performances, and the performer always starts their show by like saying, I'm so glad you guys made it. Just give yourself up for making it. And I always thought that they're just saying it, because how hard can it be to make it, right? But then <laughs> only when I, it is my chance to say this, had I realized how you know, genuine this expression is, because I really um, appreciate you guys for making it, because you have so many choices nowadays, right? You really could have done any other things than coming here. Uh, <laughs> I organize events myself and I can really see like the ratio between people actually showing up and people committed to showing up is drastically decreasing over the years. Because just people have so many choices. They don't, they don't, they say yes to things, but they don't actually come to things. I see it in myself too. So if I said yes to a thing that's at seven and it takes 10 minutes to go to that thing at seven, then any time before 6.50, I would have no idea whether I could actually go to that thing. Because I can't make a decision, I just can't until this, like, this pressing moment. So thank you so much for making your right decision or a decision at your 6.50 moment tonight for each of you. I really appreciate it. I uh, hope you meet some new people, have some nice conversations. Uh, you're gonna lose touch with 99% of the new people you met tonight and forget about almost all the conversations you had, but that's okay because it's not about the content, it's about the feeling. You're gonna remember this feeling of tonight, whether it's a good night, okay night, horrible night, that's what you remember. The same thing applies to my talk. I'm pretty sure you're gonna forget all about it pretty soon, I assure you. I'm always recorded and I'll share the slides after. You can download it, save it at a corner of your drive, but chances are you're not gonna open it ever again. But it's okay, as long as you remember the feeling. You know, if it's good night, bad night, that's uh, okay with me. So with that expectation, let's get started. Uh, going to talk about how to have fun. Well, by the way, I don't know if you realize, but this is like the highlight moments of my life right now. Look at, <laughs> look at the schedule of the event. It's people coming in, I give a talk, that's it, people leave. I've never had this opportunity. I'm always among like 100 speakers and I'm the 47th or something. Uh, this is like my night. Uh, so I really feel like I don't deserve this. But wait, as women in AI, I think we're always told that we shouldn't say those things to ourselves, that we don't deserve things, right? So we should, I should make this mental correction that I totally, utterly deserve this. <laughs> Um, that's an overcorrection that you just saw. Uh, but really, this could happen, um, couldn't have happened if not for Puja, the organizer. I really thank you for inviting me. And thank you uh, to Southbox Commons for hosting me. I've always wanted to visit. I heard great things about this place, and so glad that I'm here. So I'm going to talk about how to have fun in AI research, and why am I talking about this? So the, like the mistake thing that I just brought up earlier, that we feel like we don't deserve things, that's actually the theme of this talk. It's not a topic. The topic is about fun, like how to have fun. But that's the theme. That's why I want to talk about this topic. So I feel like I made this a topic the moment that I know I'm talking to, uh, you know, probably like women in AI community. I don't know how to like characterize this community, but people maybe feel a little bit undeserved, maybe feel like a little bit out of place when they're doing things. So why do I want to talk about it now it has to do with, uh, I think this is the right crowd. You know, you can be interested in women in AI, or you see this title, you're like, uh, I kind of need that. I have less fun in my life. So I feel this is the right crowd and the right time. I'll explain these two things. Why is this the right crowd? I, so it's hard to like, put labels on people right now that you know, it might not be a women or minority, but I think the crowd is the people who see those words and know that those words are what it takes to succeed in whatever field you're in. And you see those words, you're like, I'm not exactly that. I mean, I'm kind of that. There's overlap of me and that. I'm sometimes confident and leadership, but I'm always, not always that. So people who see like they are a little bit on the other side of the scale, I think that's a crowd that I want to speak to. And why is it the right time? Well, what is this time? This time is this decade. We're in this decade. And this timeline is, uh, the whole time that the AI has been developing. So AI is not a new field, it has, been, it has existed for a long time, but this green time is the decade that we really see some progress. You really see what people call revolutionary uh, progress. Uh, so why is, what happened in this green box that uh, made it revolutionary? The truth is, it's just like neural networks started working. Um, so this is the time that neural networks working, and this is also a time that we make AI progresses. If you choose a simple proxy as the number of archive papers, you see this exponential growth in number of papers published online. 
uh, in on archive that's with a subcategory of, of AI. So that's a proxy of AI, progress is AI. Another pro uh, proxy of our stress level is having a similar curve. It's actually the same curve, just like <laughs> minus 20, because like that's the amount I can read every year. So the same curve is also our stress level, I can assure you, a prox approximated by the number of archive papers that I didn't read, which is the same number minus 20. So this is why this is the right time I want to talk about fun, because our stress level is so much high, so high here. Uh, realize like all these subcultures are AI, so you sum them all up, that's your stress level. So that's the right crowd, and I think this is the right time to talk about fun. And we need fun to reshape our behavior. We need fun, of course, in life in general, but we need fun um, in, this, in this vertical specifically, because I want to um, talk about this quote that I really like. It says, it takes an enormous self-esteem for women to listen to things like that and not to be demolished. So it's quoted from Vera Rubin, uh, this like, badass astronomer, women astronomer, maybe the first one in history. And I feel like we are, as a crowd, we're just like so much demolished by you know, everything. And we really have to have this like, internal fun that we believe our work has to be able to go on. Another quote um, introduces like, a bit of a heavy topic about gender gaps. So with all these years of progress, you see gender gaps closing down. But at some point, it stopped progressing. So in some distribution of this higher earning uh, distribution, women are still underrepresented. And people are saying that it's not because of discrimination anymore. It's not, at least not the leading reason. And the reason has become women's own choices. So women, after some age or after some level, they chose to step down. They chose to take care of the family. You know, this is their own choices. You have all the freedom to make any choices you want. I'm not saying you're wrong. And I see that in myself. We have this nature of like going back to family and, and like connections more than the work. Uh, I used to have a dog and I really just don't want to go to school or pursue any career whatsoever. I just want to be, spend time with the dog. So I want, I want the love connection more, way better than career and, and, and you know, get up on stage and talk and things like that. So I feel like it's useful to remind people that the same kind of fun or similar kind of fun can be found in the work you do. And maybe just having that in mind gives you more options when you make choices. So, so the choices you made are not entirely yours. You may think that you have all the freedom to make any choices, but you, all, your choices are also shaped by social norm. So if you see more women you know, going to work, you feel like, oh, that's what I wanted to do. You see more women stepping down and taking care of family, you may think that that's what you wanted to do. So social norm affects your choice, and to think of it in a different way can help us defy social norms. So this is entirely kind of a heavy topic, but uh, I've recently been reading um, the research of Marianne Burchett from University of Chicago, and I really like her research about gas ceilings and things, and that's what like, motivated me to talk about this. And really, the complete sentence of what I wanted to say is that how to have fun in AI research, even if you think you're not the person that can have fun, you're not the person that you know, have what it takes to, do a good, to be a good researcher, even if you think that you don't have all the qualities that people kind of show you that they do. So I, myself, identify with all these this categories. Um, you know, when you look at someone who said they're who are identified as a successful researcher, they're always, you know, someone, I don't know, started coding when they're six, or, you know, just really like computer things, and that's their dream. That's not my dream. I, I had my first computer when I was 21. I didn't know how to code at all. I had all the passions in other places, because we were never culturally influenced to like the things. But still, I have fun here. So if I can have fun, also I'm like the least fun person you'd know. <laughs> I have no hobby. My hobby is to write sad, bitter prose. <laughs> That's my only hobby. So if I can have fun, I'm sure you can. <laughs> cool. So the plan for tonight um, is that I'll go through a number of projects, because that's like my bread and butter. That's what I do every day. Uh, I do research projects. I'll go through some projects, but really the plan is um, with all those projects, I'm going to show you, or we will analyze together, what a complete research cycle is like. And what's important is that throughout the cycle, how you can have fun. So spoiler alert, those places are where you can have fun. <laughs> but <laughs> you'll know what it means after you go through the four heavy research projects with me. So bear with me. If you want to know what it means, uh, it comes in later. 
So back to the projects, so we're going to go through four projects. And the scope of projects, um, you already know that I'm going to talk about AI. And not just AI, but AI research, which is kind of a smaller domain than AI. We publish papers. We try to you know, study how things work uh, and write about it. And an even smaller domain is deep learning, which is kind of like the driving force of AI right now. Not entirely, but part of it. And deep neural networks is like the tool people use in deep learning, in case you don't know. And this is the scope of all the projects that I work in. So basically, my everyday work is just stare at this thing that's called deep neural networks and try to figure out, try to ask the questions that people haven't asked before or haven't answered before, because that's all research is about, and finding new questions to answer. And questions like, what does it mean when it trains? You know, people say a lot about training neural networks, training a model. What does it mean? Well, like, what, what does it really do when you train it? What information does it encode and not encode? And what's its complexity? People say that this one has millions of parameters, but that is that a really good measure for how hard or how complex this network is? And how much can we control it? So I'll use four projects to answer these four questions. They are project one, two, three, four. And I will note them in this corner, uh, left corner. Didn't know that it was like cut, cut it off a little bit, but this corner will show that which project you're in. So you, kinda, you can measure the progress. And we can get started with uh, the first one. It's called Loss Change Allocation. Uh, so each project, we have a bunch of co-authors. So this one is led by Janice and co-authored with Hattie, who's here, and uh, my coworker Jason. So it's published at Neurops last year, a few months ago. So basically, it thinks about a problem as when you train something. I've, I'm, I'm not sure like, what's the level of um, things people do here, but has anyone train a network or a model or anything. So can you tell me like what you do when you train things? Like what do you look at in terms of how to, to know how well your training has been going? Yeah, yes, <laughs> exactly. So we all do the same thing. We look at loss. Oh, oh well, the answer is there. I should have hidden it. Uh, we also we look at the loss. So we make sure we do some kind of thing so, so that loss is dropping. We, we you know, do something that's dropping and maybe it's plateauing somewhere here, but we do something smarter, like drop in learning rate or something that people say are helpful, so it's dropping again. So that's the only thing we look at, and that's the thing that we trust, which is great, because you need measures, you need metrics. If you, do, you have done any projects, people are like, define metrics, that's the first thing you need to do. So that's great, but to a researcher, that's intriguing. And because that's reductive, because we have a whole network out there that has lots of information. So we're reducing all the information to one value, one scalar value. Uh, and that seems like a waste. It's like all the information are thrown away. So as researchers, we're just trying to think, if you think what happens really between the last iteration and this one, and of course, loss moved. Uh, and, but the, the reason is that all the parameters moved. So in a network, you have lots of parameters. Every one of them is moving. And the, the reason that the loss dropped is because all of them moved. So the question is, can we know each parameter's contribution to the loss drop? So the loss dropped, everyone moved. How's everyone's movement impacting the loss drop? So that's the question we want to answer through this project. So the method is we develop this what's called loss change allocation. So if the loss changed, I don't know, 25, you know, you have 25 parameters. Did anyone contribute one or some contribute 29 and other contribute nine, minus four or something? So that's like the, the measure we want to develop. And it's actually simple math, which I won't go very deep into, but basically you have something that's already per parameter. That's your gradient. If you are uh, familiar with gradient descent method, you already have something that every parameter has that's like their gradient. You always have, you also have something that every parameter has that is how much they moved, like their previous value and their current value, how much like, in quantity they moved. So basically, if you dot product those things, if you time those things, that's how much they're impacting the loss. Of course, that's uh, simplistic because there's uh, curvatures in things, but like, basically, that's how much they're impacting the loss. If you have a gradient, that's your direction. If you have actual movement, that's your actual uh, distance you moved, and that's your loss. Uh, that's your contribution to the loss. So what it means with this method is that if you have k parameters, you have k loss curves. So you don't have just one loss curve now, you have k of them. So k can be up to millions and billions uh, as the scale of current network goes. And if you sum them all, you recover this. That's what we like. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, grounded, because it's grounded to a loss curve. And you can also not sum them all. You can sum over every neuron, every channel, every layer. And that allows us to find all the interesting behaviors. 
So you have k loss curves. So what do you think they're like? So the hint is that they are actually not all dropping. You would want them to be all dropping, so every parameter is helping, but that's not the case. Um, because we have so many parameters, so we can just plot them. So here, like every dot, every color you see is a parameter. This is a tiny network, but that's already so many parameters. And green, whenever you see green, they're helping the loss. Whenever you see red, they're hurting the loss. They're making the loss go up because the parameter is moving in the wrong direction or you know, something's wrong there. So the takeaway is that as training progresses, there's lots of red. That's the takeaway here. What it means that you, every parameter is thinking that they're moving towards the direction that helps with the loss because that's what the direction means. Gradient means the direction that makes the loss go down. So everyone's thinking they're moving towards the right direction, but then they end up actually hurting the loss a lot, which uh, is all the red. Same thing with uh, and LeNet, uh, convolutional neural network, train MNIST, you see lots of red. So that's basically the takeaway here. So now with all the data, the greenness, the redness, what can we do is we can plot lots of things to understand training. Now we have all the data, way more than just a loss uh, scalar. So what we do, you can think of ways you can do. One is that you have greens, you have red. So how many of them are green, how many of are red at each given time? So we can count that. So that is uh, counted by this curve. So at each iteration time, we put, we have two camps, like green camp and red camp, and we see how many percentage of parameters are in green and in red. So in this situation, which is MNIST, some are in green, some are in red, and a bunch of them are in white, which is not doing anything because it's MNIST. MNIST has uh, black pixels uh, as input, so uh, many parameters connecting to the black pixels are not doing anything. So that's a thing just for MNIST. So you can see that less than 50%, almost at any given time, is actually helping the loss, which is the green. You can also think that, okay, so less than 50% are in this green camp, but maybe they're, when they're helping, they're helping a lot, and when they're hurting, they're hurting little. Maybe that's why the training goes. And this curve is saying that, yeah, the green is like, this is a histogram of the, the value of the greenness and redness. So this curve is saying that, yes, the green is helping slightly more, but not that much. It's like mostly similar. Uh, and another interesting thing is you can sum it over layers. So this happened to be a three-layer neural network. So you can see how many percentage of people of parameters helping for each layer. You can see that there's around 50%. And this one is showing um, for each parameter, if they're in the green group, are they always in the green group or they jump around green and red? So this one's saying the percentage that, are, that they're in the green group is actually around 50, which means they're just jumping around all the time. Because if they're staying in the green all the time, then the problem is easier. We can just train them and not train the red ones. But this graph shows that, yeah, you can't just single them out and train them because uh, every parameter, 50% of the time, they're just in either group, they're jumping around. So we do the same thing for CIFAR. Uh, ResNet, uh, yeah, the legend here is missing, but it's a ResNet, so now we don't have white anymore. It's a picture. Um, every pixel has as a parameter that's working. But you can see this like number between green and red is so close to 50% that is shocking. And like this again, it's very similar. So the whole training is driven by just like this tiny difference between green and red, not that much. And every layer is also around 50, and also this distribution of each parameter over the number of iterations that they helped is also around 50. So the takeaway here is that learning is really noisy. Barely over 50 parameters are helping, and every parameter hurt almost 50% of the time. Um, we also have other findings that you can look at in this paper. So other than learning is noisy, you also find that some layers just hurt. So this graph is really interesting. If you train a ResNet on a CIFAR, this one's cut off, but like the first layer and the last layer always hurt. Probably better. Uh, the first layer and last layer always hurt. It's red. So that's, that's interesting um, that they have this pattern. It's not just one ResNet. You train it 100 times and plot the um, confidence region. It's always like this. And there is like synchronization you can find across layers. Like when they're learning, they're learning together. So that's also very interesting. The details can be seen in the paper, but I'm not going to go too very technical here. But that's like the things you can find by using this method. So second project is called Intrinsic Dimension. So this one's a bit, also a bit messy. I'm not going to go into the method. I'm going to tell you what we found. So basically, this is a method that you train a network not in their full space, but in their subspace, which means you have a network. You have, I don't know, 100 parameters. 
So your full space is 100, because each parameter can freely move. You have 100 dimension of your training space. But instead, we want to train the whole thing in a space of, I don't know, five. So you project the 100 to a small space of five, and you only allow the movement in that five space, which is illustrated by this graph. So if you have a space of three, you can move it anywhere. But if you uh, use a hyperplane of two dimension and allow parameters only move in this dimension, that's a restriction you're adding to the network training. So that's something you can do, but like no one would actually do. Like, why would I restrict the training to a subspace? Like, well, I just want network to train well. So that's something only researchers would do because we want to see what happens. I don't know, it's just interesting. And it has some usage actually here. So once we do that, we have this interesting finding. So back then and still now, I guess people are working on these tasks. So they're MNIST, CIFAR. People also shuffle pixels in MNIST just to study the generalization problem. Their image net, and then RL people are working on these tasks. So there's like a sea of tasks out there that people work on. But then you also know that people in vision know these tasks well, people in RL know these tasks well, but there's like, there's not, not a method that links those field together. And with intrinsic dimension, you have a number for each task alongside a network, so you can easily link all those tasks together. What I mean is this. So if you have MNIST, which is an easy handwritten digit uh, recognition problem. You, pair, you can solve it with FC network, fully connected network, and you can also solve it with uh, convolutional neural network. And then you do that intrinsic, intrinsic dimension thing, that is, what's the subspace, what's the smallest subspace that you can train it in and still re achieve the approximately similar performance. And one gives you a number 750, the other gives you 290, which means that there's a much smaller subspace, intrinsic dimension, by using ConfNet to solve MNIST, which basically says ConfNet is a better tool to solve MNIST, which makes sense, which we all know, but we just never mapped it to a number. So now you can see that ConfNet is a better tool to solve MNIST, but this is how much better they are compared to fully connected neural network. You can also do the same thing, and a confirmation we got here is that by using FC on the shuffled pixels, this number doesn't change, right? Because fully connected network doesn't, doesn't care about the order. So that's like confirmation that uh, we want to see. And this number increased a lot. That means convolution neural network, convolutional neural network is no longer a good tool to solve image once the structure continuity is broken. So it's a good tool when there's something structural um, information there, but it's not. And this, is like, this number shows that clearly. Also, you can do CIFAR, and you measure the number here again. So that's interesting, because people do MNIST and people do CIFAR, they're like, yeah, CIFAR is harder, but no one really knows how much harder. And this stuff tells you, well, about 10 times harder. CIFAR is a 10 times harder problem. Of course, conditioned on that you're using a convolutional neural network to solve CIFAR, and you're using some network to solve MNIST, but like, roughly you can say that. And MNIST, we never get to measure the real number, but it's over 500K. And you can measure that with humanoid. And now the interesting happens, things happen here is that now you can say, oh, actually getting a humanoid to walk is about as hard as solving MNIST with FC network. So this statement never, it was never made by other people because no, no one really connects different fields by a single measure. And making Pong to work is about as hard as training a CIFAR 10 with FC network. So that's something that you can know. And getting an inverted pendulum to work is like really easy, just four dimensions of, of um, freedom, which makes sense because it's just like left, right, or something like that, up and down. I don't know about RL, but so, so that people should be aware that working on RL, sometimes problems are really easy. So this work is documented in uh, this paper called Measuring the Intrinsic Dimension of Object Landscapes and published um, two, three years ago at iClear. Um, so project three, we're having a good time. Um, so, uh, so this work, ChordConf, uh, basically we're going back to this curve. Uh, and really like, I really like this graph. And this is like, OK, things are happening here now that AI is, is booming. But so neural, neural networks start working. But how where are they working? So you all know that now neural networks can help us identify um, dog's breed in an image. And it can help us identify small objects in an image. It can help us play games just directly from pixels. And it, it helps us uh, with the help of GAN. It can help us generate images, like photorealistic images, 
from pure noise. And all these are helped by a simple tool called convolutional neural nets or confnets. So once like all the amazing things are happening, it is perhaps interesting to know that once uh, to use a confnet, you can find this mapping between a pure noise and this like photorealistic image. It might be really surprising to, for you to find out that to use a confnet to do this is really hard. And by this, I mean, I want to give you a coordinate, and you paint a pixel for me that is at the coordinate that's four, four and six. And of course, when I move the coordinate, you have to move the pixel accordingly. So I just want this task to be solved, and I'm using a confnet to solve it. Given that confnet made all the success stories possible, this shouldn't be so hard, right? And we call this problem coordinate transform. Uh, and we found that confnets fail at this simple task. So um, we ended up devising like whole experiment to prove that by you know, creating a data set and train a bunch of ComNet with, with all the data sets, and it's still very hard. But I'll be sweeping all the experiments. So just believe me that when I say this is very hard for a convolutional neural network to do to solve this coordinate, co coordinate transform problem. And we thought maybe it's because you're using a deconf, because you're painting a pixel. Maybe painting is hard. Maybe if you reverse the direction, it will be easier. But again, we find it really hard. And here, again, we like devised a whole experiment to collect data set, sorry, create a data set and train neural networks. It was still hard. And actually, we didn't, we weren't like interested in this problem at all. We found out it's hard because we were trying to do something different. So I was working on a communication problem where I have to train GANs to generate objects moving around. And I found that very hard. So the risk that we got here is because we were trying to make the text simpler and simpler, and found out that they were harder all the way. So, because we were trying to debug this problem, like why generating images that move around is so hard. So we're trying to make it simpler and simpler by you know, removing the loss from a learned discriminator to a supervised loss, like making the color go away and making the square to be just a pixel, and we still find it really hard. So like this is a whole investigation process lead us to, oh, the coordinate transform task is hard for convolutional neural networks to do, which makes sense, because convolution, if you know, they're just looking at local regions. They don't know the coordinates because they don't see the big picture. So convolutional neural nets only see the big picture when you stack them up and, and their region gets larger and larger. So it's, it's, it makes sense that they don't know this, but you wouldn't know it when you just directly use it to, say, generate some GAN image. So we call it an intriguing failing of convolutional neural nets that it cannot do coordinate transform. And we propose this substitute of convolution called quartconf. So convolution, again, is this way. You map a tensor to another tensor by looking, by having small filters um, share the weights across locations. And we propose that you should see also, so the, the convolution or deconvolution should also see coordinate information. So we propose this form by simply just appending coordinates to, to the input tensor. You can use it anywhere. And that should solve the problem. So we'll prove that this is great because it preserves all the good things about convolution. It has few parameters. It is fast to compute. It is not translation equivalent anymore, but it can learn to be. If it learns the ways to this uh, two channels or zero, then it recovers convolution. If it knows that it should be data dependent, uh, translation dependent, you can also learn to be that way. So you can use it as a layer, and you can just swap out any convolution as cord conf or not, like one or all of them or three of them, as much as you want. You just have more options. And we use um, experiment to prove that it fixes all the poor problems of the painting pixel ones. And it also, if you just um, switch it in all these tags, it gives good results uh, as well, except Image classification, which makes sense, because in image classification, you don't need to know where the objects are. So you have a dog in the image. If it's here or here or here, the answer is a dog. So in, in, chance, in applications where location information is not needed, it's not improving, that's, that's um, understandable. And in all the other tasks, it improves the, the state of the art result. So the conclusion of that project was that we found that is this curi curious inability of CNNs, common nets, and we propose a better version of it, and we show that the performance was good uh, in almost all the tasks. So that was uh, a New Europe's 2018 paper. And now we come to the last one. So this, we're really switching the context to a totally different application, that's the language generation. 
again, we're looking at this picture because I'm really in love with this picture. Okay, we are in this great green zone that neural networks are working, but what really is working? Uh, if you zoom in, what really working is that, you know, the whole time CNN is working. So calmness, which we just looked at and proposed a better alternative to. And CNN works well in vision problems. And very excitingly, since 2017, uh, the transformer architecture has been working, and it's working well in NLP problems, natural language processing. So we're also, we're no, not only in this big green box, we're also in this super, super green box. Another thing is working. And uh, to quote my colleague, Jason Yosinski, he said, what transformer architecture did to NLP in 2018 or 17 is like what Alex and I did to Vision in 2012. And uh, I'm paraphrasing. I think this is what he said. I also confirmed with him and he said, I guess. So what he really said is, I guess, but like, this is my paraphrase of it. And also our researcher Sebastian Ruder from DeepMind said that NLP's <coughs> image jam moment is happening right now. So that's exciting. But what do they really mean by like, what Transformer did to NLP and what's the moment? What will release the moment? Like, what's, what's happening there? So what's happening there, uh, there's lots of things. But one really exciting area is, is called language modeling. And um, this is in GPT-2, so produced by OpenAI, also you know, uh, helped by Google's Transformer architecture, which, uh, if you guys know, like, is a machine that just generates text for you. It's kind of like GAN, that generates pictures for you, but here's your generating languages. So it usually is used by human giving it a prompt and asking the model to complete the passage. So in this example, human is giving the model a prompt saying that in a shocking finding, scientists discover a herd of unicorns and they have, uh, they're living in Andes Mountains and everything like that. And the model finishes the passage by like, making a whole story about this unicorn, giving it a name, telling that they have four horns, silver white unicorns, and, and they speak perfect English somewhere. So it's really amazing that they can, that this co coherence of language they generated out of nowhere uh, that is happening. And also an interesting detail they, they seem to have paid attention is uh, University of La Paz, so all these things are generated. So why La Paz? Because, um, because we said Andes Mountains in the prompt. And La Paz is a city in Bolivia that is next to Andes Mountains, so that's Andes Mountains. So not only that it generate coherent realistic passages it come somehow like captured all the you know, geometric information that it probably has captured from all the big training data. So that's interesting. So we were like uh, fascinated by the progress in GPT-2 in language generation. But we were thinking, but what about knobs? Like it's generating, but then you can't really control it. What if you want to do, you wanted to generate some things that you desire? Let's say you started a sentence with like a sad beginning but then you really want something happy. So let's say you have a knob, you can turn up happiness and somehow can control this generation towards a more happy ending. That would be interesting. And or this um, example that uh, was crafted by my colleague Jason, that let's say you receive someone uh, from like, uh, it's like with toxic language. What if the model can just uh, de detect that toxicity and really turn up niceness and make it this like hugely nice, very nice message that's not intimidating and, and uh, offending at all. <laughs> well, by the way, this is never achieved. This is our, our dream. This is, uh, probably can be helped by AGI, but this work <laughs> didn't achieve this level of intelligence. But like, this will be something we want to do. We want something to control the generation. The same as if you're using GAN, you can't really control it. You want it to, you can um, control it by training a conditional GAN, but if it's trained unconditionally, it's hard to control it. So this is kind of like our our way to, um, our motivation to this project. We want steerability in generative language models. You can turn up happiness, niceness, and maybe like all kinds of topic. Maybe you want the model to talk about cats because you like cats. And can you just say, talk about cats more? Uh, if you want positive or negative, you want more happiness in it. Or if you can maybe switch styles, I don't know, maybe now you're talking like a 60 year old person, try to talk like a three year old, something like that. Like we have all these ideas of how to steer a model can we really make it happen in this project? So um, we designed this model called plug and play language model, PBLM. And the idea as illustrated by this, by this picture is that 
GBU2 is such like a huge mammoth, a huge animal that just like wanders around by itself generating things. And we want to control it, but we don't want to retrain it. Because of course you can control it by retraining it with all the positive tags. So it will start talking positively. But we don't want to retrain it. We want to control it with a tiny, what we call attribute model. That's trained conditionally, but it's tiny. So you can imagine the whole thing working this way. You have a language model that's basically P of X. So it's trained unconditionally just to generate next word or next token. And you have an attribute model that's P of X given A. That is, if I'm taking this test, I can tell you if it's positive. I can tell you if it's talking about cats. I can tell you, you know, all the attributes that you really want. And you want to combine them together so that it's generating the way that you want it. So the way language model works is it takes in one word at a time or token at a time, generate the distribution of all the possible words, take the best one or you know, sample the top 10 or something, one and then feed it in, generate the next one, feed it in, the next one. So usually it would work this way. But then at any point, you can also connect it to an attribute model which tells you, oh, say I want this whole thing to be positive. Now this attribute can tell me whether it's positive enough. Maybe it's not, maybe it is. I would have a gradient, so grad is a gradient. I would have a gradient signal telling me how positive it is. If it is not, let's move it more towards positivity. And when I say move it, I mean the latent. So I'm not touching any of the weights. I'm using gradient signal, but I'm not touching any of the weights because I don't want to retrain anything. I'm only touching the latent, and latent here is the keys and values. If you know transform architecture, it's the keys and values of that transform architecture. So I'm shifting the latency a little bit so that the next word generated is more positive, say, delicious as opposed to okay. So that's like, that's the gist of it. Um, and we also, of course, you can push something to be really uh, higher probability in this P of X given A space, but you might lose the fluency that the natural language is generating. So we also keep, make sure that it's also, you make this ascend, but you also make this ascend at the same time. You want to make sure the language is positive but also fluent. So some examples, you can train a tiny discriminator on some movie reviews that's either positive or negative. That's like a tiny, tiny discriminator trained with tiny data set. Uh, and of course, like compared to GPT-2, it's much tinier. And then you plug it in with GPT-2. Uh, you freeze all the transform block and you train it on top of GPT-2 representation. You plug it in to GPT-2 and now it does something like this. So this is from GPT-2. You give it a prompt, that's the potato, and GPU-2 says, potato is a plant from the family of the same name that blah, blah, kind of like neutral, no sentiment. Now you, you turn it to be negative, because you have a controller now that's training from the movie reels, and it starts to talk about how potato is a bad idea, can make you fat, can cause you to have a terrible immune system, can even kill you. Remember that we train all the attributes from a movie review, but this is nothing like a movie review, because GDP2 is still controlling the way that it talks about things. You're just controlling the, the sentiment. You can turn it to be positive, and now it talks about potato chip that everyone likes. We love making this, and we've been doing this for years, and so many little ones. So all the positive attitudes seems to be getting into this language generation. You can also start with something different. The year is 9010. In the beginning, it was just like talking something neutral, and now it's, uh, if you turn it negative, it's talking about a group of young men in a factory attacked by a gang of street raging drunks. If you turn it to be positive, it's talking about this, someone winning this lifetime achievement prize. So that seems to be working. Uh, you can do it extremely, because you might say that, well, like this prompt is like, you can, it's very easy for a model to say positive or negative things with this you know, neutral prompt. So uh, we can try like something really extreme. Like if I say my dog died, can you complete the sentence with positivity? Uh, and this is, this is exactly from the model. I'm not <laughs> fooling you. And uh, it completely saying that the dog died at the age of 92 years this year. It was a legendary home. It's like full of positivity here. Well, not factually consistent, but it's, it's interesting. <laughs> we can also start with the food is awful and try to turn positively really up. And it says food is awful, but there's also music and the story and the magic, like all the exclamation point that it loves to use kind of it picks up that exclamation point is associated with positivity. You can also do the other way, negative, we start with food is amazing, but the negative model would say it's also not, it's not the kind of stuff you would just want to spend your money for. So it's working, nice. Uh, 
of course, as a scientist, when you submit your work, people can always say that you're cherry picking, you're showing me the samples that work. So we did a bigger study with human to show that it really works. So we're comparing these four variants. So this is what we propose, a controlled generation, and this is what we're uh, comparing against, just basic GPT-2, and there are two variants that's just ablation studies. So we showed that if you're controlling for sentiment, 73% of the time is associated with the right sentiment. So we ask humans to rate you know, whether they're uh, associated with the right sentiment. If we're making it positive, is it actually positive? And the baseline is 19, so we're doing well. Um, you can also use an external classifier to do sentiment classification, and we also outnumbered there. So this is interesting. So if you, like, if you separate, so that number was uh, an average of positive and negative, but actually we have two classes. So if you separate these classes, so that number is exactly this number. So what's interesting here is that if you just take GPT-2, so baseline we didn't do anything, and ask people to rate whether it's positive or negative, actually like 40% of the tax GPT-2 generates are negative. I guess it's not surprising that GPT-2 is trained with all the internet taxes, mostly negative, but this is just like, uh, our human study kind of validated that. So a lot of our very negative already, and our, our method making more negative, and they're not very positive to start with, and our method making more positive. And what's in between our two variants of the ablation study. So uh, we also don't want to lose fluency, because you can always make something really positive, but you lose the coherence of tax. You can make some models say great, 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 great all the time, but that's not what we want, so we also want to control the fluency. So this number is just showing that the fluency measured by perplexity, dist one, two, three, some measures that people measure fluency, they're not too uh, far away. And so that is by controlling with an external discriminator. You train a tiny discriminator. You can also control it with just back of words, because if you want the models to start talking about cats, you don't need a cat discriminator. You can just see if there are cat in the text it generates. So that's pretty easy. You just have a back of words that you want the model to start talking about, and you try to ascend the log probability of those words. So this is a model that, is, uh, that has zero parameter. You plug this model in and say, I want it to start talking about military. And I plug that in. And those words with red are the words in the bag. So I want to ascend the probability of this word. And the model does the right thing. It doesn't just start talking about this word right away. You know, it makes the whole um, sentence coherent to like, lead to the military. Uh, topic. You can also make a model talk about space if you want. Um, so space and all the solar Earths are words in the actual bag. And what's interesting is that light years is not in the actual bag, but to be able to talk about space, you start to talk about you know all the relevant words in the in in, in the topic. Can you can make an odd prefix, pre prefixes? So remember before we try to start with negative and write, want the model to make it positive. Here, we try to start with something totally not military and wanted to talk about military stuff. And somehow, it's still able to do that. Like, we start with a chicken and like, ask it to talk about military. So it starts to make a story about chicken-shaped robot known as a killer drone. And we start with horse. They, they're making a special weapon system because it's a, asked to steer it to military. A pizza shop that kills a transgender teen with suit. A, a, a potato-sized monster and the lake um, it's a base camp of some army special operations. And you can do the same thing with politics. You start with chicken, and it talks about chicken pox epidemic. That's pretty smart. Like, I wouldn't have thought of a way to hack the sentence generation so that it talks about politics from chicken. So, like, appending the pox to the chicken. Um, pizza industry start talking about taxes. Potato as a vegetable source for the NHS. Something about tax break. Something politics. Uh, you can talk about computers, starting from chicken and horse. It's almost, almost always about games or some chicken and egg problem. That's pretty smart. Um, and again, like other than showing you samples, people would like to see numbers. So we do we collect like thousands of samples and show it to people and ask people if they are um, coherent with the topic that we asked to generate. So that's the distribution. And again, here you can see like how many. Original texts from GB2 are already talking about sciences. So the human evaluators think you know, around 30% of the text generated by GB2 is already science. 
but also like this number don't add up. Uh, you, we, can, we only try seven topics and they already add up to be more than 100%. So there's like human bias here. When you ask human like, is this talking about science? They're like, yeah, I guess it is. It's like they would say yes to most of the things. But uh, still like we kind of outnumber that, that thing here. And fluency are kind of close to each other. Baseline has of course a higher fluency because you, you cannot get more fluent than baseline. Because that's a GPT-2, you're limited by GPT-2. But we're not too uh, worse off. Uh, cool. So, but I talked about multiple knobs, so I really want to like try. Can I make something computer theme, and also fantasy theme, and also make it clickbaity? Because we have a clickbait um, discriminator. So this is what it generates. I wanted to start with pizza, which is not computer or fantasy. So I'm like steering, really making it a really hard steering problem for the model. But it's, it's able to make um, this patch that says this line of sizzly pizzas and also the latest creation is going to be more than that. It's a giant robot that's able to pick up a whole host of different things. So the colored words are the keywords in the according bags. So something pretty fun. Um, you can achieve fine grained control because this is a knob. So you can assume like it's not like zero turn on and off. It's like something you can adjust the strength. So if you start with the potato and you want to make it science, you can turn it a little bit, so it starts about like energy in, in science. You can turn it more. Now it talks about, you know, there are more keywords showing up. So the red ones are the keywords in the back. These like light red ones are related words. And you can turn it more and more, the red will show more and more. So you can see that at some strengths, you lose the fluency. So that's what we expected. With any knob, you want it to be able to turn all the way up to see that it's doing this. This is like a validation that our method is working. So now it just generates the words in the bag and forget about the fluency because you're shifting the latent so much that it, the fluency broke. So that's what we wanted to see. Cool, I went through all the four projects. Thanks for staying with me. Um, and I'm going to talk about finally the research cycle thing. So through the four projects, which is what we do every day, well, what I really want to talk about, if you still remember the title of this talk, is how to have fun. Um, so to be able to talk about that, I want to show you the research cycle, at least the cycle that I've been through. So every place probably does research differently. They have different cycles. But at least our cycle is something like this. You always start with something, some idea that you have, an inspiring idea. Hopefully it's inspiring. Uh, you, before doing anything, you need to do a literature study, because probably someone has already done that, then you should kill this project. It's not getting you anywhere. You would only get you negative remarks from the reviewer. So literature studies is useful. You need someone to really run something as preliminary result to see if it's working, because it's very likely that it's a stupid idea, and then you should really kill it at this stage and before moving it any further. If it's working, you plan a larger scale of experiments and execute them. So that's really needed. You might need to replan and keep executing because this planning uh, fa fails. You may, you may need to do it many times, as many as needed. I'm showing three chunks, but it can be as much as, I don't know, 10. Depends on how lucky you are with that inspiring idea. You may have your first promising result at some point. So that's good. That's when you should start writing. And while keep executing. So, so writing and executing should, uh, should be doing at the same time. And then you went to, you go into something called publishing process, which is really painful. You submit to a thing, people review, it's really bad, and you have to defend yourself by saying something back. That, that's defensive, but also nice, because you, you don't want to piss them off. <laughs> uh, so it's, a, it's a painful process, but once you get through that, hopefully it's accepted. There's more writing, because you get to you know, make slides and make a talk like this and have some creative creativity into your posters and things. So that is, in my mind, kind of a whole research cycle, at least how we're doing things these days. And the blocks also happens here. Uh, of course, the, the length of each chunk can vary. Uh, depends on your idea, depends on this project. But it's like basically something like that. So now, where do we have fun? It's really, it really depends on who you are. As I said, I want to make this talk so that Whoever you are or whoever you think you are, you can have fun. So say you're a visionary. You really like ideas. You have, you're kind of on top of what the current research is. You know, you read lots of papers even though you never implement them. You kind of know what's going on, what's hot, what attracts people's eyes. Then you can have fun, of course, in the stage where 
people are brainstorming ideas. You know, during this planning and executing, you can correct, you can give corrections to their directions. You can kind of have fun throughout, but only sparingly, obviously under coder. If you're a coder, good news, you are needed most of the time, <laughs> except maybe there's like small chance of, of the writing, you don't need it, but we need you most of the time because AI is still a heavy computer engineering field. If you're a creative writer, you're needed less, but you still need it, you can have fun here. If you start writing, you can really find this, you know, motivation of keep, keep, that keeps you going in those places. And, sorry, if you're a manager, anytime you switch tasks, you would have fun because you, you have to like push people together. Nowadays, the projects are larger and larger because people are trying to, you know, flash out projects faster and faster. They try to make to every conference so you can see like paper with 30 authors is not a thing anymore. That's when you really need a project manager that's like pushing people to do things. So if you're a manager, all these switching tasks are, are interesting. You can't make this switch happen. Whether it has a promising result, it really depends on the coder and the other people, visionary. But the other switch points, um, you can make it happen. If you are an emotionally healthy person, you can have fun anywhere, because <laughs> we need that. You really need to be a stable, emotionally stable person, because any failures in any of these chunks can set you off so much. So that's the basic idea. Of course, I'm omitting a lot of other types of people. But what I'm trying to say is that nowadays the research project is such a large thing, it's almost like making a movie that you need people from all kinds of fields with all kinds of skills. So which is the good news for you, because if you don't identify yourself as like this badass coder that can just you know, code nonstop for 24 hours, you can still have fun if, you're, you, know, if you find um, yourself well situated in writing. Right? So that's good news for you. You don't have to be... Um, Dejected just because you're not good at something, because you're always good at one of the things. Well, maybe you say that I'm just not good at anything, then at least you're self aware, which is better than <laughs> most people I meet these days. So, so we need more people in AI research, and I'm sure one of your skills is going to fit into this curve and make it a fun thing for you to do. Uh, so, what was the most fun I had in, say, these four projects? I thought about it. Uh, I was taking different roles, and also you don't have to be in one role, you can be writing and managing, you can be coding and emotionally healthy, that's hard, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, so I was um, probably like mostly coding here. Later here, I was, I was coding here, but here I think I was mostly writing and coding a little bit. But when I think about like what was the most fun bit that I had in this project, there are this. So with loss change allocation, the really fun is that you have so much data that you can plot, you can make all this interesting visualizations and, and understand what's going on in there. And the intrinsic dimension, what's fun is like the fact that it works. So we have this idea that you can train a network in a subspace, but there's a chance that it wouldn't work. Like what if it just didn't work or you train it with one, but you re-randomize it again, it doesn't give you the same number, then that's, that's a failure. But the fact that this method works, it was, uh, Great fun. And CoreConf is really unique. We were trying to do something else and we ended up finding this uh, alternative for convolution. So this whole investigation process was fun. And for PLM, the making of Wooly, which is what we call this mascot, is fun. And just a showing of how we made Wooly. <laughs> it started with uh, people drawing just like sketches on the wall and then someone made it digitalized and made different versions of it and we refine it. And at some point, this is pretty good. We were like, no, but if people treat this, they wouldn't know that it's PPLM because all they see is GPT-2. We don't want to you know, make GPT-2 more known. So we added PPLM, like moved all the text elsewhere so that now we just treat, treat this picture and we are known or something like that. So it's really a movie making process that every project has to go through now. There's so many you know, publicity around it. Uh, at some point, if you're a drawer, if you're a drawer or you're a painter, you can have fun even in a research project. That's um, unprecedented, I guess. So that's my talk. And I want to also throw in another quote I really like that says, science is competitive, aggressive, demanding. Of course, you experience all the pain, but it's also imaginative, inspiring, and uplifting. That's where you can have fun. Uh, and I want to thank all my collaborators through the years. Um, and this is my information. I happen to be looking for opportunities, like the next fun thing to do. So uh, if you have anything, let me know through all the means. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.
be nice with questions. <laughs> I don't handle questions well. How come I didn't have that beginning? <laughs> I to speak so loud. <laughs> I was just uh, curious in your research cycle how you mentioned, uh, you know, a project manager, for example, and your experience uh, for the non-coders, um, how much AI knowledge must they have in order to be an effective project manager? Um, so we were, we have always been in a situation somehow like all the collaborators are AI researchers to start with, for better or for worse. I think a lot of times it's for worse because we're not good managers. A lot of the times that we, as a coder, has to double as a manager, which is like, at least for me, is so painful. Because I have to like, encourage people to do this, and if they don't deliver, I start like, hating them, and I don't want to hate them. <laughs> so like, all the management <laughs> skills I'm lacking. So I can't say, like, I think, in my imagination, if someone that's really good at management that comes in, it would really make the whole process smoother. I haven't got the chance to really have someone that come in as that. But I see a lot of in the, say, product development world, people who make products, product managers a big part of their, the whole project going on. I think the level of their expertise, I don't know. I can't say, but I think about 60%, 70%. That's probably good enough for them to know like, who should be put in here and who should be kicked out because they're not delivering uh, at this moment to make this process run. Yeah, so that's, that's only my guess because we didn't have the chance to. They like have a great manager managing all those things. It's always either the first author or the last author, which are um, not, it's not their nature to do that. But thanks for the question. Do you know ahead of time if it's going to work or not? Because you can do one cycle to 10 cycles to 100 cycles, but like, how do you, it's very high leverage, that first little blue thing. So like, what are some things you look for to know if it's working or not? They don't know. So that's why, that's why visionary people are important, even though sometimes if they don't code, you're like, why are you deserving an authorship? You didn't even code a line. But they're actually very important because they make the right call, because they've seen enough. They've done maybe 100 projects in their lives. They've, they're on top of all the development in the AI world. They can tell, like, oh, this, this is not the right direction to go, or this is the right direction to go. Because any, at any point in the cycle, you always feel like there's 100 things you can do, but you can't do all of them. And they are the person that point out this is the most profitable, like, at least to this project. They can see that this is a promising result. And that, even though it seems promising, might not be. So I, at least for me, I really rely on just like visionary people um, in the team. Um. Uh, I'm going to ask you about tips, advice on reading research papers. So, you know, I've. There's a lot of uh, advice online, okay, take one pass, first pass, just go through the abstract and the conclusion and this and this. But what have you, f uh, you know, in your experience uh, have found that it's taken me multiple classes to really understand what yeah. goes in, inside a paper? And it was that. And actually my, my advice is just the, probably the stupidest way, just read a lot and then you'll get it. Like each one person probably have like their own style that's most suitable. I can never read something backwards, like get to the results first and then go to the introduction later. I have to read it multiple paths, as a, at least that's my method. And after you do it many times, it, that definitely gets easier. I think we all have the ability to learn, like our networks. We can train, we train ourselves in, and whatever method you start with, if you stick to it, you fit in enough data, because we are a model that we learn, <laughs> usually it gets easier and easier over time. And uh, I also organize a re reading group, paper reading group. So that's the good thing about some papers I just really can't get through. So I just send it to someone else who has that expertise and they present it. Uh, that's like my, <laughs> my hack of getting through papers I don't want to get through. And, and I guess the key is like don't be stressed out by the amount of papers because there's going to be thousands of papers that you miss. It's OK. Tens of thousands. And that's OK. Um, not all of them are interesting, really, other than those four papers <laughs> that you should absolutely read. <laughs> no other papers are worth reading. But, but yeah, the truth is, I think at least papers is, uh, they're more structured. They're always kind of following the same structure. So after you go through it multiple times, you really get it faster than, say, reading, I don't know, other creative writing works. So have faith. <laughs> you have my emotional support.
Uh, are there ways you found to have more fun in AI research than like the baseline level of fun? Are there ways to <laughs> I increase the amount of fun that you can have? Because I am someone that my friend called, uh, I'm someone who has a really low baseline. Like every time, every morning I wake up, I'm just not happy. And then I, <laughs> and I go to work out to make myself happier. So some people work out to, you know, boost up their energy to make them happier. I need to work out to survive, basically. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just like so depressed. So I need all the fun. And for me, I just have to remind myself, it's OK to be not good at, say, coding, to be not good at writing, because there are other parts because the research project is so big now, there are other parts I can contribute. And there are parts that I can feel that I'm part of a team that I'm not failing, I'm not just falling behind everyone else. Because I don't know, I'm someone, I guess, uh, as maybe some of you, that have like somewhat low self-esteem. So I need all those like encouraging words that I say to myself that it's OK. I don't have to be the top coder to finish the project. I can also just to be someone who's really persistent, who really sees the project through. And I think that's my role in the last one. It's because it's such a big one. We have someone who code OK. It's like, but well, like, bottom line is none of the coders here are great because we're researchers. That by definition means a bad coder because we go through research training other than you know, coding <laughs> exercise. So like, the hardest part of this one is just like, carrying it through because there are so many things to finish. And people just give up uh, in the middle all the time. And to be someone just next behind uh, and to them saying that you have to finish it through. And that's an important role, and we can act as those roles. It's OK. Yeah, that's my, <laughs> don't know if that's a tip, but that's what keeps me going. Following that comment, I have a question. Um, have you ever dealt with not having a team with all of those different perspectives and like not a good coder on your team, not a good, I don't know, manager on your team, or even like not having access to visionary people in your team? Or are you like, even if like when you are um, doing everything by yourself, for example, or you have a very inspiring idea? So yeah, that definitely happens. That's why like we have to make use of the limited resources for me is like <laughs> this hundred of people. And everyone's better at something, but uh, they're probably like, there's, there's a rare chance that they're just top world level, like badass person in that, in that expertise. But um, you actually don't need that much to complete the project. <laughs> so you might see like lots of papers published in these days, but the bar is not that high. You just, actually the most important thing is to finish a project. Everything else is easy. The, the hardest thing is just carry it through. Just finish it, write it and make sure everything happens, or the experiment part, the writing part, and the whole cycle thing part happens. And it doesn't take that much for you to adapt to different roles. You might think that you're a bad project manager somehow, but when you get that role, you start doing that, you know, you get better. So there are definitely cases that we have to double <coughs> other roles. There are papers that with just two authors, so of course, uh, each of them has to do with the whole thing, have to watch the whole cycle. Uh, it gets easier when you know more people. You after few papers, you develop relationships, which is something I find challenging uh, in my work life. That is, I feel like maybe as women or as you know, uh, people that I identify with, I, just, I, I don't just have to develop work relationships with them. I have to be friends with every one of them. I find that like, really challenging. So I have to find a group of people that I really like. I can't just work with people that are just like my coworkers. I have to develop a real relationship with them. But once you do, uh, everything's easier afterwards because you have a relationship. Next time you know who to go to, if you need some things done. So. I'd love to hear more about your personal story about how you got involved with AI to begin with, because I actually didn't know that you got your first computer when you were 21. And like, I think that's a really interesting story. Yeah, um, so I just somehow get into electrical engineering major, not the major that I pick. So in China, we go to this ex uh, exam that everyone has to go through, and you pick a major, and you're put into the major if your score is above that major's acceptance score. So I, I put biology as, as my major, and I didn't get in because biology was so hot and back in the days. Uh, so I was like downgraded to electrical engineering. So I knew nothing about engineering. <laughs> so. So I don't know if my experience would um, help with anyone, because it's really by accident. So within EE, I, you know, I just trying to pass. It was so hard for me, because I don't know anything about electricals. I've never interested in like, radios. All those people telling me stories about, like, they disassemble a radio and they were sick. I was like, that's not my story. 
I don't know how to relate. I'm just someone who's really interested in books. So I want to get to literature and in English or Chinese, uh, like one of those history uh, majors, but I didn't. I somehow was uh, placed in this major by force. But, but really, that's what tells the story, right? If, if someone as forced as I was can find fun in this, <laughs> everyone can. Like, if someone as untalented as I was can find fun and can do a good job, I really think every piece of my uh, projects is something that I love, something I cherish. If I can do that, everyone can do that. And I'm so um, you know, underprivileged. And yeah, but you, and, and, and I find myself, because I love books, I find myself to be really interested in, in the writing process. So in the beginning, I really helped a lot in that. I think that makes kind of my projects or our projects stand out. I think I've heard people saying that your papers are just much pleasant reading than any other, or no, not any other, but than most papers. Like if you have something that you, know, you feel like you can identify as you're good at, then I'm sure you can find a place in research projects. Great, well, I think that's a great stopping point. Um, I think everyone can stay around to mingle a little bit more and definitely go up to Roseanne if you have any specific questions and check out her papers. I think she does have her papers and she writes prose online. So she does have a really unique writing style and I love her papers. So definitely check them out. Thank you.